Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this first uh, plenary session of the 20th Common Core of European Private Law General Meeting. 20 years is a long time, and uh, it's uh, you know, very, very nice to see that uh, the project is still going, and it's going well. This morning we had uh, three very interesting and productive working sessions uh, at the campus Luigi Einaudi of the University of Turin um, uh, on property contract and tort that will continue tomorrow morning in separate groups according to the arrangements that were made. And then we will re re rejoin here tomorrow for the final, uh, for the final um, plenary session at, at 11 o'clock. So these are the two moments in which you have a chance of being all together. And it is uh, now traditional, the first day is uh, devoted to um, a topic. And this year the topic is uh, um, the legal culture of European technocracy. Uh, it is a great honor to have uh, some extremely distinguished guests with us this morning. Uh, Professor Richard Goldberg from Durham Law School in the United Kingdom on my left. Professor Maria Rosaria Ferrarese from the Scuola Superiore della Pubblica Amministrazione in Rome, Italy, on my first here on my right. And then uh, uh, Professor Francis Schneider, whose uh, current affiliation is at the Peking University School of Transnational Law after a long time, a long career in Europe that, and uh, uh, that uh, now, he was stolen by the rising, the, the rising power, I guess, okay? And <laughs> so, welcome, welcome to everybody. As, uh, I, will, I will just give a few remarks about, uh, about the title of, the, uh, of, uh, of this plenary and, uh, and uh, a few very limited thoughts, as usual, on my side, and then we will open to, to, the, to the actual um, contribution to this session. Uh, when it's over, we will have uh, some discussion uh, in the usual, in the usual um, system. And uh, we will then have uh, at uh, 6 o'clock or whatever after that a, a cocktail reception down there where we'll have some time to, 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 to get together and to, um, and to better get acquainted. Uh, most of the people that came this year are long-term participants in the Common Core. Some of them have been here for, uh, you know, for the, were, were there during, 20 years ago when we started with Mauro Bussani in, in, uh, in, uh, um, in Trento. Among them there is Franz Verro and Matthias Reimann, that, whom I welcome with particular uh, affection. And, uh, of course, I welcome everybody, everybody else too. And now let me... Let me Think a little bit about uh, with you about this 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 title of this uh, of this uh, uh, plenary. It's almost an oxymoron to talk about technocracy and culture. Um, <laughs> so it is a title that is uh, uh, problematic in, on its face. Um, technology is supposed to be a uh, an application of science. It is supposed to be something that uh, grows over time. It is supposed to be universal. It is supposed to make obsolete everything that was on a previous technology. Uh, second generation of cell phones make the earlier generation obsolete. The third one will make the second obsolete and so on and so forth. That is in the nature of technology. Uh, technology can consequently be evaluated in quantitative terms, in terms of what technology delivers, how it accomplishes certain goals, and uh, it is actually possible to evaluate te technology in a very axiological way. Uh, my radio on the car has better technology than your radio on your car. Uh, so there is a better or worse kind of uh, relationship between, between the different kinds of technology, okay? Culture, on the other hand, uh, 
lives in a domain that, at least in our common sense and understanding, is an entirely different thing. First of all, it is very difficult to get quantitative about culture. Um, culture is something that can be actually understood much more in terms of quality than in terms of quantity. There is no necessary improvement from one culture to the next culture, even if the Western project has been very much into transforming culture into technology and in claiming superiority of a certain kind of vision of the world, a certain kind of understanding of reality as opposed of everyone else. However, uh, anybody who, is, uh, who grew up, grew up uh, over this very simplistic vision by which better technology implies better culture, which was very much part of the colonial project. Colonial project was about you know, claiming superior culture because we had superior technology. Uh, we were able to conquer, Napoleon was able to conquer Egypt because of better technology. And of course with better technology, better military technology mostly, uh, then you know, the narrative around the technological advantage that came out of the Industrial Revolution made the culture that provide that kind of technology superior to every other kind of culture. Uh, today, of course, we are, or we should be, at least uh, in uh, polite, decent circles of people that use their brain, over that vision and that image, and we kind of understand, or we should understand, that cultures cannot be compared on the point in a sort of an axiology saying that one culture is better than another one, okay? And to be true, uh, to be sure, even in the law, um, some of this tension between culture and technology, these sort of different domains in which culture and technology uh, live, or should live if we try to understand them in their nature, has been mixed up quite a bit in these last hundred years or so. And you know, the European Union, the European project, the project of unification of Europe, uh, certainly made the technological component of the legal system, that is to say, an approach to the law in terms of problem solving of specific technical issues that society has to face becoming pretty much dominant in the general vision. Uh, when we talk about technocracy, therefore, when we talk about the legal culture of the, of the European technocracy, we mean that by a claim of using the law as a technology in the process of constructing institutions, uh, power gets centralized in certain institutions themselves. Technocracy means power of technology. And power of technology when it comes to a domain of social relationships such as the building of a European system is, means basically that one certain, one particular vision uh, gets over every other alternative vision to create some sort of single thought that is recognized, at least by those that participate in that game, as superior of its alternatives. In comparative law, we have been very busy over the decades of our discipline uh, to talk about legal cultures. Comparative law has been growing from a formalistic, black letterish, doctrinal approach, such as the one that was at the origins of our modern conception of comparative law earlier at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, the famous Congress of Paris. We've been slowly, I would say very slowly, 
moving away from that kind of a doctrinal approach. And in doing so, we've been trying to take into consideration the fact that the law is actually much more of a rich uh, artifact uh, sharing quite a bit with culture and maybe not sharing so much with technique and technology. So comparative law moved away from an earlier very doctrinal formalistic approach all the way through a more culturally sensitive approach to the law itself through you know, years of studies and understanding in which certainly the formalistic original imprint remained very important, but that was also producing a quite important critique. Um, if we think about uh, the origins of the common core methodology, just to talk about our own things here, uh, back in the 50s, that was an attempt to reach a richer, a thicker understanding of the law than the one that was used by comparativists before. When the functional method was elaborated and introduced at the Cornell Seminar and then in the long tradition that followed the uh, footsteps of, of, of Rudi Schlesinger and of the other functionalist comparativists, the idea was that the law was actually something that can, could reach different results by means of a very various uh, number of sources that play out in different ways, some of these sources being actually conscious des designed structures and other being legacies of the past and sometimes of the even very ancient past. When we started the Common Core of European Private Law specifically, uh, Mauro and I have been, and the others with whom we started talking and discussing these things at the beginning, we were actually very much concerned of the fact that what was going on in Europe, very visible then and even more visible today, perhaps uh, today with some variations, uh, was the sort of a reductionist approach to comparative law by which the European legal systems could be classified in two major families, and these two major families, the common law and the civil law, would themselves express three or four dominating legal systems, German law, French law, English law, and a few others, and this idea was actually reducing the all kind of legal culture in Europe that was recognized as such by the, legal, by the legal community. And when we attempted to understand European private law as a, at the time, 17 legal system enterprise and today 28, was exactly to say, well, you know, we need actually to consider all these variations, all these country-specific legal cultures in a position of equal grounds, in a position of considering them all on a, as, a, as possible contributors to a framework of European law that is rich because it's enriched by a lot of very different contribution from the very different countries. And in fact, this issue of legal culture became, over time, a quite important contribution of comparativists to our discussion in comparative law. Uh, even to some extremes, you know, sometimes there has been comparativists claiming that legal systems could not be compared because they were coming from two different cultural understandings of the law, that comparative law was necessarily an hegemonic uh, project because it would actually erase the kind of differences and the kind of subtleties that you can understand only by deep participatory observation. There has been a ki kind of a rich phase of that kind going on. There has been also in a, a moment, in a specific historical moment, that is uh, the moment in which uh, the Berlin Wall fell. Actually, today is the 20th anniversary of the 
uh, of the Common Core. It's also the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and in, in especially, you know, in the, in the first years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there has been a very visible uh, tensions within the European legal systems to safeguard something that was considered culturally specific and that we were not really willing to lose against the European technocracy in Brussels. If you think about the work of some earlier scholars in the discipline of the people that were talking about the usus odiernus pandectarum, uh, like uh, uh, Reinhard Zimmermann, and others, the whole point was to safeguard certain kind of cultural aspects of the law that were to be, uh, in a way, maintained in a, some sort of Savinian way of the evolution of the legal system with the law as a product of the false geist of the different places as opposed to a European project that was going more and more in the direction of producing a unified technocratic uh, building. Um, there was a time, and you remember after 1989 when the European Parliament recommended for the first time codification of uh, European private law, and then later in the early part of the 90s, there were uh, quite a number of meetings, uh, especially the meetings about uh, whether it would have been a good idea to codify or not at the European level, in which the cultural claim as some sort of non-changeable uh, aspect of the legal systems, of the dominating legal systems, was coming up very clearly. I remember myself a meeting in 94, if I'm not wrong, right the year after the Common Core was born in, uh, in, the, in the Hague, in Holland. There was a big conference about European civil codification, and at the time, every single jurist was actually claiming that his own understanding of the law was actually the European understanding. I remember that in that conference there was a French guy who gave a very good talk saying that, in fact, we already have a European code and that the European code was the Code Napoleon because not only was European, what was global. And then there was a very distinguished uh, German colleague that said that we already have a European civil code because the highest example of the European legal culture is actually the Allgemeiner Teil, the German BGB general part, and therefore it will be enough to translate it in the different languages to have it becoming the European, the European civil code. And also, you know, the Dutch guests at the time, they had a brand new code, they said, well, you know, we need a cosmopolitan code in Europe, and we in Holland happen to have one. So why don't you just get it, and, and here you go, you have the European Civil Code. And then there was the famous moment of my colleague and friend uh, Gandolfi from, uh, from uh, Italy, that I was there sitting saying, I wonder what this guy is going to tell now, and he was pretty smart. He said, well, you know, sometimes codes, codes are like living entities. And some of these codes would, are too old. The French and the German are too old. And some of these codes are too young. The Dutch civil code is just too young. Then there are middle-aged codes, those that actually prove to be young enough to be still energetic. And the Italian one happens to be <laughs> actually in the right age. At the time, was 60 years old, you know? So there was, and then, of course, there was uh, our other colleague and friend, Basil Marchesinis, who said, talking on behalf of the common law tradition, that this whole idea of codification was just stupid, that Europe should be a, there was, a, we should work for a common law, a common law of Europe, okay? That was a moment in which legal culture, in a way, was extremely nationalistic, highly chauvinistic, and was not really ready to move ahead in the project of building something of a cosmopolitan nature. Um, unfortunately, this uh, cosmopolitan project, the idea of trying really to understand from the differences between legal systems what is already in common and what would be something that fits this sort of 
broader and larger strange entity, which is a market of a half a billion people, uh, which is Europe. And instead of doing that, we've been actually fascinated by the uh, wind arriving from the other side of the ocean. And just at the end of the 90s and the first part of the current century, uh, it was a time in which uh, in the European legal culture, uh, the technocratic approach produced by the Anglo-American law and economics functionalist turn became very fashionable. That was the time in which scholars started to talk about competition between legal orders with this sort of neo-Darwinian vision of the law as the outcome of a competitive model in which the fittest will eventually survive, and the fittest tends to be all the time the more friendly to capitalism. That happens pretty often. Um, later on, you know, we had the, in the same period, we had the time in which we gave up the idea of codification, and we started saying, well, maybe we don't need codification, we need a restatement. And you know, the restatement, of course, is a typically American way to deal with the differences, marginalizing them in some way, and granting, in a way, to legal culture, to the culture of American national law schools, predominancy amongst the sources of law, because then the specificities of the states are just left left behind. And that was the time in which restatement of European law became an important and, uh, and a, 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 a kind of an important and important project. Similar time was when people were talking about model codes, about the idea of producing, and this is where we are now, I would say, these ideas of producing codes of law that are scholarly products of some sort of cosmopolitan nature, but cosmopolitanism in that kind of projects becomes pretty much groups of self-appointed leading uh, experts of the different legal systems getting together and finding some sort of common ground that it means to say to create a legal system that ends up being really a mouth without teeth because you know what you find in common are just so to say the very basics of a system of incentives that works through in the same way in which the national private law work as default systems. Um, that was the time in which it seems to me the technological approach to the law, the problem solving attitude that it seems to me was the product of American legal realism as transformed into the more functionalistic economic approach to the law of the 80s penetrated the European landscape in a quite significant way. And that was the time in which, it seems to me, the legitimacy of the European law became something that could be measured in terms of transaction cost reduction. In other words, the European legal system was to be considered more and more desirable as long as it reduced the transaction cost from, for internal dealings of uh, business in one uh, country with another, another country. So the technocratic approach to the law seems to me is actually nothing that is in, per se a technology, because we are talking about human institutions, but is something that actually uses the technological rhetoric in order to gain currency in constructing a legal system that is market friendly and open for transnational, transnational business. Um, of course, you know, this idea of distinguishing technology from science uh, is itself as the idea of distinguished law from economics or science from culture, you know, this sort of very, this very model of separating fields and making ultimately something in the social domain that is non-political is not at all a sort of uh, condition of nature. It's actually itself a cultural project. There is no question that the big separation between politics, law, tradition, the economy, religion, 
customs, and all of that has been part of a very clear project of keeping the political discussion outside of the law in order not to make the issue of economic and political distribution of power relevant at all in the uh, discussion about the law at any kind of level. Um, of course, you know, all of these are things that can be questioned. We can be questioned how much non-political is a technocracy, and it seems to me that today we came to know that actually technocracies is, are quite political, are actually very political. They just produce a certain kind of politics that deploys certain kind of strategies in order to legitimize itself. And this is when the issue of the legal culture of the European technocracy comes out. Because in Europe, with the complete absence of an open political conversation at the European legal system level, a, an open political conversation that is carried on at the level of issues that regard politics at large, so with the maintenance of the political discussion and conversation at the state level, uh, what it is open there is a space of non-declared politics that still is at work as a chain of transmission for policies that are actually created at levels that today are much more economic than political. And this has changed really pretty much the very idea of statehood in these last 20 years, and also the very idea, I would say, of local politics. Uh, the local institutions that, for example, in this country were extremely important in the construction of the national identity and in the construction of the protection nets and of the welfare systems have been transformed quite dramatically into places of execution of policies and orders that arrive from the top down and are just transmitted to the bottom by means of hierarchies that are justified as more efficient and smooth than otherwise the political process will be. So in a sense, you know, it seems to me that this culture of technology within operations and activities, those of a bureaucracy such as the European one, uh, that deals with actually transactions that have to be with human beings is ending up actually maintaining a system of power that marginalized very much the countries rather than united them. And this is something that it seems to me a legal culture should overcome. You know, if, if we can claim and we can construct a legal culture that is actually respectful of the differences and the variations without being at the same time chauvinistic, we can imagine at least to endow those institutions with some sort of a common um, purpose and a common vision that might become very useful at least in a choice of some sort of candor in, the, in, in discussing the options and the directions we are taking. So I don't want to take you more time with my uh, blah blah and I will then go directly to give, to give the floor now to Mr. Goldberg. Thank you very much for being with us and thank you for your patience. First of all, I just want to thank Ugo Matei and Mauro Bassani for inviting me today. You will hear my voice, although I actually am a professor in an English university, I am a Scotsman, a survivor <laughs> of the recent <laughs> referendum. You won or you lost? Yeah. <laughs> But I'm happy to be in Turin, home of Torino and home of Juventus as a Celtic supporter. <laughs> but we move swiftly from football to a different culture, a different religion perhaps, which is 
looking at this concept of technocracy, which was raised by Ugo, and I'm looking at it within the context of research that I've worked in for the last few years, which is um, medicinal product regulation and liability. I take the view that it's one of the most important areas in European technocracy and that it has a sort of legal culture of its own, the regulation of medicinal products in Europe. Now, technocracy gets probably a legitimate bashing, um, and I expect it to be bashed to bits uh, this afternoon. My initial approach was to try and slay the technocracy dragon in some kind of Wagnerian Rheingold scene, as some kind of figure like Siegfried. Um, I suddenly realized that it's not as simple as that within particular areas, including my own. I have to concede that there is some form of justification for a technocratic approach to the area that I am currently researching in, European drug regulation. If one defines technocracy as a system of governance by an elite of technically trained experts, that certainly seems to be consistent with Ugo's emphasis of power being centralized in certain institutions. There is an element of justification for this, but I think there is a need for greater democratization of the drug regulatory system in Europe. But we are private lawyers, you say. Why? Am I talking about that? Because I feel that there is the need, and this is very important, for the development of increased democratic rights in private law through the use of litigation. Through the use of litigation concerning the liability for medicinal products and the need to utilize such lit litigation as a complement to drug regulation. I take the view, and there's a lot of work that's been done in the Common Core over the last few years on product liability, I take the view that there is a need for doctrinal coherence of the law specifically in relationship to medicinal product liability, um, and that there is a distinction developing between that and the general Common Core work in the area of product liability. My fear is that until we have this coherence, the law will continue to be relatively underdeveloped in this area. And that because of this lack of development, drug regulation will continue to dominate the legal landscape with its emphasis on technical expertise. Now, let's look at the issue of technocracy in the context of European medicines regulation and the precise genesis of where this has all come from. I think it's useful when you look at or you try to understand the legal culture of European technocracy to look at Professor Roger Brownsword's discussion of the role of public ordering or governance of human societies. In terms of his categorization, medicinal products have both ex ante and ex post elements of such ordering. The ex ante element in this context refers to the pre-marketing authorization stage of drug regulation, whereas ex post sees the operation of both product <coughs> liability and the law of tort or delict to provide for compensation. Where are the origins of this ex ante element of public ordering? They have their origins in the tragic events concerning the drug thalidomide, or contergan. There was an inability in various um, countries in Europe to establish that uh, 
Kemi Grunenthal was indeed negligent. And this was very prevalent as a problem within Europe. As a result of this and the inadequate regulatory machinery which was in place at the height of the thalidomide disaster in 1962, various countries, uh, including the UK, but in Europe more generally, uh, came together to establish a directive, Directive 6565 of the 26th of January 1965, which is basically the beginning of drug regulation throughout Europe. The whole point of this legislation was to make member states adopt measures to ensure that no proprietary medicinal product could be placed on the market unless a authorization had been issued by what was called a competent authority of that member state in accordance with the directive. Of course, competent authorities link in with the idea of certain institutions where power gets centralized. And as in the United States, where Daniel Carpenter has clearly demonstrated in his book on the Food and Drug Administration, where you had a development of reputation in power, the FDA taking place in the early 1960s, we had a similar concentration of the development of reputation in power and a corollary with that, a, a technocracy developing in the whole field of the regulation of medicinal products. And it was effectively created in Europe at that time. It exists at basically two levels. It, it exists at the national institution level, the issue of the, the competent authorities, basically the regulators within the individual member states, and also at supranational level as well, with the European Medicines Agency, which is conveniently based actually in London, in Canary Wharf, which of course was all where trouble started in the banking crisis. Or was it America or whatever? What's the sort of justification here for this technocratic approach to drug regulation on a European level? Well, it's a view basically it's a view that drugs or medicinal products, as they are termed in European law, they are complex. And that pharmaceutical regulation is a techno-scientific activity, necessitating the making of decisions by experts. And by virtue of that, in these circumstances, the view is taken that the public is incapable of contributing to such technical decisions. And to extent, to a certain extent, this view no longer holds water. Most of the arguments against this approach, against a technocratic approach, have actually been developed by sociologists. And it's they that became interested in the issue of technocracy and drug regulation. So for instance, Davis and Abraham have argued that the degree of secrecy surrounding the regulation of medicinal products in the European Union, as well as America, is detrimental to both science and democratic accountability. They submit that there can't be full participation, there cannot be full participation by citizens, and indeed by clinical professionals, as well as pharmaceutical professionals, in the debate as to how to maximize the role of healthcare where regulatory information is concealed or where it is unavailable in a timious manner. So, to a certain extent, the EU has responded to this. It certainly has developed recent measures to improve transparency in the regulation of medicinal products by introducing a more democratic approach to support, at least on the face of it, more public participation, albeit within the constraints of a technocratic model of decision making. The first of which I list in the handout, under the heading changes in pharmacovigilance legislation to strengthen post-authorization regulation of medicines. 
As a Canadian colleague of mine, Trudeau Lemons, with his fellow Canadian colleague, Shannon Gibson, have astutely put it, the goal of improved post-market surveillance is to ameliorate patient and consumer protection, not only by strengthening the knowledge base of regulators and healthcare decision makers, but also by improving patient and consumer knowledge and understanding. Now, the main reason for changing pharmacovigilance legislation from a European Union level, of course, had to have some economic justification towards it. And the main reason that they gave was the increased burden of adverse drug reactions. So the public health burden of adverse drug reactions amounts to the death in the hospital of about 100,800 to 197,000 annually in the EU, which is costing 79 billion euros, according to our Commission staff working document. And this is an annual figure. This is how many people die every year? 100 to 100,000, yeah, 100,800 to 197,000 annually. In England? No, throughout Europe. Throughout Europe, Europe. Yeah. okay. okay. Yeah. They, so they try and justify this on a, essentially an economic level. And they introduced the, 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 the changes to pharmacovigilance in 2000 and child by virtue of that through a European Union regulation and a directive. Now, the first new example of this was the so-called PRAC, the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee. Note the language that I use in the handout. Article 61AR of the regulation 726-2004 means that the composition of PRAC is not entirely technocratic. So the situation is that one member and, the, and an alternate to represent each member state will exist, plus one member and an alternate to represent both healthcare professionals and patient organisations. In addition, there are six members operated by the Commission on the basis of expertise. All other than the member state representatives will be appointed following a public call for expressions of interest. So the emphasis here is upon a partially untechnocratic model. And there are other examples of this improvement in transparency. There is the obligation to set up a European medicines web portal and on national competent authorities for national protocols, which I won't go into in detail, but they do demonstrate by the list of things which are the minimum content for European protocols and for national protocols things that are designed to increase transparency. What I will turn to is the other main area, the most recent area, which is the area of data transparency in clinical trials. Now, to be fair, the European Medicines Agency, as it's now called, um, during a public consultation process on the implementation of transparency measures for clinical trials data, introduced a prospective data release policy last year. The whole idea behind this policy was to introduce public sharing of data on European Medicines Agency approved medicinal products on a publicly accessible website. The problem is that while the industry organizations have appeared to support the concept of transparency and data sharing, these pharmaceutical industry organizations are also at it. They are supporting legal challenges to the policy. So in 2013, the United States pharmaceutical company AbV brought an application before the General Court of the European Union to suspend the operation of a decision by the European Medicines Agency to grant access to clinical study reports on a medicinal product called Humira. Now, initially, the president of the general court agreed to the suspension of data access, but there was an appeal 
by the European Medicines Agency that the decision be set aside. And that was successful as a result of a decision by the Vice President of the Court of Justice on the basis that the uh, President of the General Court had erred in finding a fundamental right to protection of the company's business secrets. Now, again, there has been strict transparency requirements introduced for data access and reporting as a result of a regulation of the European Parliament on clinical trials. The emphasis is especially in Article 81.2 and 81.4. So this is an idea about a European Union database enabling citizens of the European Union to have access to clinical information about these products. And the presumption that these, the database would be publicly accessible unless confidentiality is justified on the grounds of inter alia protecting commercially confidential information, etc. And of course, this is where the, the problem arises. To what extent is trade secrets going to be used to actually block access to transparency at a European Union level. And we see that industry opposition to transparency has indeed been developing. There is a proposal for a directive, as some of you may know, on the protection of undisclosed know-how and business information, trade secrets, against their unlawful acquisition, use and disclosure. The European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries Associations has very much welcomed this because they talk about the need to protect proprietary know-how and business information from misappropriation. And they talk about it being protected at every stage in the drug development process, from preclinical chemistry to manufacturing control, as well as at the clinical trial phase. Now, my position in relationship to this is that you can't abolish technocracy and drug regulation completely. I don't think that it's so much the existence of the technocracy per se that's the problem. What is the problem is the need for transparency in its operation and independence from the pharmaceutical industry of the regulatory agencies that actually utilize the technocrats in decision-making about regulative innovative medicines. You need to have consumer organizations, you need to have public health advisory groups and patient groups involved in regulatory decision-making. However, even those like Abraham, who's a sociologist at King's College London, concede that Instances of public participation and the invocation of patient rights have also got to be subjected to clinical scrutiny in the interests of uh, public health and social justice. But what has this really got to do with us um, private lawyers, as private lawyers? What's the concern here? Well, I try and encapsulate this into the slide that's in front of you. I argue that the continued legitimation of the technocracy in European medicines regulation is being encouraged by the pharmaceutical industry itself and that there's an expense here. There is an expense of an insulation from review of the conduct of the companies themselves by product liability claims. So as we strengthen regulation, or in the face of it, strengthen it, one of the agendas is to actually destroy private law against the companies themselves. The industry in both Europe and America is seeking to legitimate the primacy of regulatory expertise by supporting a particular view. And the view is that compliance with regulatory standards should utterly and completely protect pharmaceutical manufacturers from product liability suits without any qualification whatsoever. In so doing, the industry effectively wishes to use the advisory decisions that technocrats make to support the granting of marketing authorizations 
as a shield to defend the industry against the exercise of private law actions that will result in a review of the safety of their products. And I think this is of crucial importance and cannot be ignored. And it's this issue that I want to talk about before I finalize the remainder of my talk. Essentially, it's an issue as to whether compliance with regulatory standards should provide a complete defense to liability for defective medicinal products. It's an issue which continues to command support from the pharmaceutical industry and appears in studies on the product liability systems. It appears in the five yearly reports of the European Commission. The two most recent reports regurgitate the whole view. If you take the most recent report, the fourth report, they say, effectively, they reiterate the support for a regulatory compliance defense from representatives of the pharmaceutical industry in Europe. And they opine that the directive does not sufficiently take into consideration that the medical product sector is very strictly regulated. Classic language to say, well, the technocrats have done all the hard work. There's no need for actually tort law or any form of private law to come into this game whatsoever. So in the light of this support for the pharmaceutical industry, I think it's important to be able to weigh up the respective arguments in favor of them and against them, whether you should support a regulatory declines defense or whether you should not. So what are the sorts of arguments that are run? The first, of course, is a rather hackneyed one, the risk of over-deterrence. It's one which has originated from the US experience. For example, excessive litigation costs in the United States, resulting in deterrence from research and development, affecting the availability of new drugs, causing their withdrawal from the market, loss of benefits to society, in addition to duplication through uh, overlap of dual systems. But let's face it, this argument is pretty out of date. Over the last 20 years, US courts have become effectively very conservative towards product liability in general and indeed specifically towards liability for prescription drugs. There's also no evidence, I would submit, in Europe that product liability claims have resulted in excessive costs to or the inhibition of research and development by pharmaceutical companies or that there has been a shortfall in insurance capacity or increased premiums since the overall volume of claims has been very modest in comparison with the US. And it becomes the industry, I think, to come up with the evidence to show that that is not the case. The other issue, of course, is indeed the strongest argument presented by the industry to legitimate the technocracy of the regulation of drugs, namely the expertise of the regulatory agencies with an optimum standard of safety. This idea that the standard of safety is optimum as opposed to being minimum. But this premise was rejected by the landmark decision of the Supreme Court of the United States in Wyeth and Levine in 2009, where the Supreme Court stressed the role of state product liability law as indeed a complement, retrospective, sorry, yes, a, a complementary retrospective form of drug regulation and significantly an additional and important layer of consumer protection serving a compensatory function distinct from federal regulation. And then finally, there is the argument of economic efficiency, which of course we would expect to hear. Uh, one that was talked about by the Rand Corporation in a report on medical devices in 1993. But I won't go into that in any other further detail. Let us turn to the argument against the defense. Well, if you were to do this and you were to introduce a regulatory compliance defense, what you'd be doing is you'd be effectively putting at risk the whole project of pharmacal vigilance which is the issue as to what happens not so much prior to uh, 
medicinal product obtaining its marketing authorization. But it's what happens afterwards. If you were to introduce a defense, I believe that you would erode tort incentives to disclose post-marketing risks. Basically, there wouldn't be any incentive for drug companies to seek labeling changes which would disclose additional post-marketing risks. The existence of a defense here would also undercut the compensation goal. It would probably result in a void of compensation which would actually shift all the pressure in this area to the actual regulators themselves to minimize injuries from products passing through the pre-marketing regulatory scheme. So that would probably, at the end of the day, do more damage to the pharmaceutical companies who are constantly pressing, actually, the regulators for saying there is too much time and regulatory lag in the pre-marketing stages. But the biggest reason, in my view, um, for not having a regulatory defense, defense is the deficiencies in post-marketing surveillance systems. So if you have such deficiencies, this of all things shows the potential danger of adopting a technocratic regulation system of medicines as a justification for a regulatory compliance defense. Now America's got its own position, which I won't obviously adumbrate on in detail, but a lot of problems occurred within the United Kingdom, within its own member states' authority, the, uh, the uh, MHRA, who failed to make uh, evaluations of a particular antidepressant drug called seroxat, peroxetine. A lot of reports arose, albeit anecdotal at the beginning, of akisthesia, which is extreme agitation, and suicidal behavior in children and adolescents who were given the drug. Now, it was difficult to distinguish between the underlying depressive illness and the drug-induced injury. So the manufacturer and the regulators initially felt there wasn't enough epidemiological data to have a signal which was enough to actually result in the drug's withdrawal. Then, of course, the signal comes. There is sufficient evidence at a particular stage to justify contraindication in the case of children and adolescents. And what happens, of course, is that the industry did nothing to reveal this information. There was a failure to notify the licensing authority. And indeed, the licensing authority in the United Kingdom tried to instigate a criminal prosecution for the alleged breach of medicinal product safety regulations. While it was conclusively established that the manufacturer had failed to disclose studies of the drug's effects in children and that there were gaps in the safety regulations, the government lawyers decided that the case could not proceed to criminal prosecution. Now, this generated a lot of academic criticism of the MHRA's failure to scrutinize licensing data. Um, very similar developments took place in relation to the United States with a drug called Avandia. And then we had the changes to pharmacovigilance legislation that I've talked about. But a lot of these uh, reforms have been subject to criticism. When you actually look behind all this issue of transparency, there actually is a lot of criticism about the database being truly accessible, the UDRO vigilance database to health professional scientists and the public. And I think the biggest problem actually is the potential conflict of, it, of interest that exists because drug approval on the one hand and pharmacovigilance on the other are two separate things, but they both function under a single body, a single technocratic body in the European Medicines Agency. And there is an argument that there should actually be a separate technocratic body, the Drug Safety Evaluation Agency for Pharmacovigilance. The bottom line is the recent scandals, I think, really suggest that this is not a good idea to actually adopt a regulatory compliance defense. I take the view that if you introduced a defense like this, the whole inquiry would be shifted to the issue of non-compliance, proof of which would add to the complexity and expense of the process. In short, I argue the regulatory compliance defense fails to address the challenges of post-marketing surveillance. 
far from eliminating the role of the litigation system, I think there should be greater structural links between it and the regulatory processes of the national competent authorities. But this is the nub. The regulators, and they haven't done this before, should use each opportunity of private law litigation as an opportunity to reassess its determinations on drug safety. And it is in this way that private law can operate as a means to demo democratize the existing technocratic system of drug regulation. The issue remains, however, that there is doctrinal incoherence in decisions concerning medicinal products, and there is some argument that one may need to establish a common core in that particular field. Let me turn to the final element of my talk today, which is doctrinal incoherence in European medicinal product liability jurisprudence. Now, we've seen product liability develop um, as a distinct conceptual area of law, but it, didn't really take, it, it wasn't really until the 1960s that this did occur, and it actually occurred through comparative law. It was writing, not just American writing, but also writing throughout the member states, particularly in Italy with Alpa, who was prolific and influential in this field, as was uh, Wagner in Germany. But the big thing that changed the whole area about reform was the series of major health disasters, particularly contagan and thalidomide, which led to the Council of Europe initiative, as well as the ultimate development of the Product Liability Directive. Now, it is important to remember, of course, that the directive is essentially grafted on to existing private law within Europe. It doesn't take away that core of product liability that exists within the member states. Um, and that is, of course, important to realize. What is key is that there is doctrinal incoherence in this field. The problem of establishing that a medicinal product or a pharmaceutical product is defective is, in my view, different from establishing that a Coca-Cola bottle is defective. Whether a it caused the damage is different and more technically complicated. There is also the problem associated with the so-called development risk defense, which was supported by Margaret Thatcher, who argued that if you weren't going to have this defense, there would be no directive at all. Now, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all of these things. I'm only gonna be able to mention briefly the issue of design defects and medicinal products. I've looked at this area of law for a long period of time, and the doctrinal incoherence is very much present. To a certain extent, you have to understand the arguments here. Medicinal products all carry a risk of adverse drug reactions, even in a minority of consumers. So they're not necessarily entitled to expect that the product will be risk-free. The issue, of course, is although the directive adopts a language of expectation, can you accommodate risk utility or risk benefit within the framework of the directive? And I think there is an argument for supporting this. It really, if there is to be any meaning given to allegations of defective design of medicinal products, in my view, you have to look at the benefits and disadvantages associated with a product. So, a good contemporary example is the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, which we know has been associated with litigation concerning autism, virtually all of which has been rejected. Even if it was accepted that the MMR vaccine was capable of having severe side effects, that would not necessarily mean that the product would be adjudged effective. You would have to balance the risks against the serious risks involved in not immunizing children. And probably a court would look at that risk-benefit analysis and come to the conclusion that the benefits of vaccination outweigh the perceived risks. Now, several academics have looked at this, of course, ad nauseam, including myself, Jane Stapleton, looking at the issue of cost-benefit analysis. She's looked, for instance, at uh, thalidomide and talked about the chemical formula of the drug. And she says, drugs such as thalidomide does not provide the safety to which we're legally entitled, taking into account all circumstances. But 
We know that thalidomide is effective for non-pregnancy uses in the treatment of leprosy, multiple myeloma, and AIDS. So in such circumstances, it might not be defective if it included a warning against use by pregnant women and was prescribed in exceptional circumstances. Can we adopt, for instance, a gestalt judgment of defectiveness by comparing the drug's overall benefits and risks and declare a drug defective when its risks outweigh its overall therapeutic benefits? That, the so-called macro balance test, has been subject to criticism. Now, of course, the Americans adopted a approach of so-called net benefits. Um, and actually, in the restatement, which of course is a dangerous word to use at this meeting, third of products liability, section six deals with prescription drugs completely separately um, and supports the idea of actually so-called net benefit. My sense is that an eclectic approach should be used, a one which combines the so-called Owen, the, 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 takes into account the criticism of, of, of authors like Owen, Henderson and Trotsky, and combines macro balancing with consumer expectations, and also looks at all circumstances in terms of Article 6.1. And that's probably the closest that we'll get in the context of design defects. And I think that's the one that would show doctrinal coherence. Now, there's been case law, but of course, as you would expect within Europe, it's not particularly um, coherent. One case involving an exploding condom from the United Kingdom seems to point to inroads in this direction of risk uh, benefit. A female claimant brought an action for damages under the UK legislation, the Consumer Protection Act 1987, for personal injuries suffered when a condom by the defendants failed and she became pregnant. Now, there was examination of the expectations of the consumer, but the judge, Mr Justice Ian Kennedy, added in language analogous to list utility that evidence showed that the condom had failed inexplicably under standards higher than the British ones applicable in the case. So he concluded from that that the fact of the condom's fracture did not prove that it was defective. In Germany, in the context of design defects, the German Supreme Court held in 2009 that a cost-benefit analysis may be appropriate to determine whether a product is defective in design. Now, of course, that doesn't relate to medicinal products because they have their specific strict liability compensation regime um, under the Medicines Act 1976. But nonetheless, it does indicate that the issue of risk benefit is relevant to liability for design defects. Even Professor Tashner, one of the principal architects of the directive, while reaffirming that the producer's conduct is entirely unimportant, has conceded that risk utility may be relevant to determining the safety which the public at large legitimately expects. But of course, problems emerge when we delve deep into the jurisprudence particularly in France, because the Cour de Cassation has taken a different approach, potentially rather unhelpful in this area. The Court of Versailles ruled that temporal proximity between the hepatitis B vaccination and the appearance of the demyelating myelating disease in the absence of any other known cause for the disease generated a presumption that the vaccine had caused the claimant's injury. That's a very controversial approach to causation, which, of course, is being undertaken at the moment as a common core topic nearing completion. But what happened was, in that case, the appellate court rejected the claim uh, against the vaccine producer by using a risk-benefit analysis and concluded, notwithstanding the position on causation, that the vaccine was not defective. But that was overturned by the Cour de Cassation, which held that the Court of Appeal should have checked whether the elements on the basis of which causation had been presumed did not also allow for a presumption that the vaccine was defective. So that suggests that the elements that allow for a presumption of causation may also allow for a presumption of defectiveness. So it seems to be connecting causation and defectiveness in a rather interesting way. 
and perhaps a particularly unhelpful way. The Cour de Cassation suggests that defectiveness could be assessed on a case-by-case -case analysis, independently from a general risk-benefit analysis, taking into account the specific considerations of the product. Professor Borghetti has become very angry, of course, as a result of this, and concludes that this is not a meaningful explanation of what defectiveness of a vaccine means. Now, what I will turn to is the issue of the most recent case, which is actually before the Court of Justice of the European Union right now on defect and product liability. And this case has had an opinion, and I will end my talk just at this particular point. The case basically suggests that product liability in respect of drugs and devices may be becoming technologically specific as a result of an opinion by Advocate General Bott. And it's on the meaning of defectiveness in Article 6.1 of the Product Liability Directive. It was a reference that was made by the Bundesgerichtshof. The issue in this case was this, whether a medical device implanted in the human body, that is a pacemaker or an implantable cardiovascular defibrillator, is that already defective within the meaning of Article 6.1 if, and the wording is important, devices within the same product group have a significantly increased risk of failure, but a defect has not been detected in the device which has been implanted in the specific case in point. Now, Bott regards this issue as requiring a detailed definition of the term defectiveness of the product in accordance with the wording of Article 6.1, the expectations of consumer protection, and the inclusion, note the words, of union policies regarding health concerns. His opinion is predicated on the consideration that if a particular product belongs to a group of products with significantly increased risk of failure, it can be concluded that this product has the potential to fail and does not provide the safety which a person generally would be entitled to expect. So both failure in some of the products of an identical group of products and the particularities of products determined for implantation in human bodies have to be considered when assessing the effectiveness of a product in the form of medical devices. So I give you a, a synopsis on the slide as to what uh, this effectively seems to, to be the, the answer as far as the attorney, sorry, as, as far as the advocate general is concerned. I'll just make one final point before I end here. Just a couple of observations. One, general statistics of failure do not point to there being a defect in the individual product. And arguably, in response, the, the Court of Justice of the European Union will say that the claimant has to establish that this is so. Secondly, and this is the big issue, the notion that a product, if it belongs to a group of products with significant risk of failure is defective, would be potentially devastating to whole groups of medicinal products of a particular therapeutic class, each one of which may operate in a different way on different patients. Thirdly, if the interpretation here is only relevant to particular types of product, i.e. medical devices, this would suggest that there is technologically specific approaches now developing and that there is a need for this in both medicinal products and devices. And therefore, member states may have to respond to this. So my final slide in conclusion is on, on here. Just summing up the idea of technocracy within the different levels, the justification for the approach, the attempts to improve transparency, um, and my main concern, which is the idea um, effectively that it, it, the, the legitimation of the technocracy and medicines regulation being used by the industry effectively to insulate any review through private law. Um, and I think that should be avoided at all costs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Goldberg, for this very interesting and detailed uh, case study that 
seems to me that you have, uh, you're still having quite a bit of faith in the courts <laughs> and in the private law process, which uh, you know might be might be well grounded or not. That uh, we, we will see in the future. But it's good to have a second a second look by courts for sure. I was in the church of the Turin Shroud yesterday. <laughs> And because of that, I came over with some form of epiphany <laughs> to the idea that we could pray at least for decisions being more coherent. Before. Thanks so much. And Maria Rosaria, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you. First of all, let me tell how much I'm glad to be here and I want to, to thank uh, uh, the two masters of this uh, meeting, uh, Ugo Mattei and Mauro Bussani, uh, my very old uh, uh, university mates, colleagues. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful for this invitation. Uh, this, uh, Funziona? This invitation uh, was an occasion uh, to, to reflect around this interesting uh, theme of uh, bureaucracy and uh, technocracy. Uh, I would like uh, to say that uh, a specter haunts Europe. Uh, technocracy uh, can be seen as a specter because it's not so visible, uh, it seems to be very important, very present, but in the shadow. It's not very well known, but we can say that it is uh, well uh, documented in the literature, its presence, because we find uh, in reality a, a lot of pages on uh, democratic deficit. Uh, in uh, European legal uh, uh, theater. Uh, and it may be, uh, can seem uh, a paradox that Europe, the crowd of modern uh, politics uh, that uh, was defined by Carl Schmitt as the realm of uh, the action between two enemies, uh, amicus nemicus, inimicus, uh, that just here, it was conceived, this idea of te technocracy, which seems uh, quite uh, far from uh, politics, uh, uh, quite uh, aside from uh, the idea of a conflict, uh, and quite uh, peaceful for uh, this reason. Uh, but uh, the so-called uh, knowledge economy, envisaged especially by the Lisbon strategy, probably contributed to create a, a very favorable climate for the growing, for the, uh, the rise of this uh, technocratic uh, uh, style in Europe. I want to remember the words uh, of that, uh, uh, of that uh, strategy the most uh, that uh, preconized for Europe the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world capable of sustainable economic growth with more and better jobs and greater social cohesion. Uh, we can uh, measure very easily uh, 15 years uh, after how much uh, was, uh, was reliable, that promise. Many of those promises were made in the name of the technological innovation perceived as a, a secure means of future development. And uh, now we can see uh, countries in Europe, uh, enemies each other, at least some of them, with some enemies more characterized as such, and uh, uh, also uh, bad economic uh, performances, uh, and uh, it's uh, useless to say how much Italy is uh, in a bad position in the rank of economic success. Uh, 
So I suspect that uh, that uh, idea, the, the enthusiasm that was around the Lisbon strategy and all the the climate that uh, uh, contributed to create it uh, was uh, uh, one of the, uh, the the idea founding the force of the technocracy. Uh, and then I want to thank again uh, the organizer for finding this theme of the legal culture of technocracy, because very much has been an, under light the idea of the contrast between uh, democracy and, uh, and technocracy, but not so much the idea what the relationship is between law and technocracy. So this is a quite... Uh, uh, new theme on which I think there is uh, not so much in literature and so it was very stimulating to think around this, uh, this, uh, um, this um, subject. But what is technocracy? And what threat does it pose? Why is so frail? Technocracy, we can say, is a form of rule by expertise and technical expertise is a tried and tested way of providing solutions to problems in a given field following supposedly scientific criteria. We could say, in fact, that technocracy is expertise at the top rather than expertise on top. There is this uh, singular gioco di parole, this play, uh, that uh, uh, technocracy should be at the top, but in Europe is uh, on the top. Of course, expertise is uh, a necessary evil in our, in our age, and uh, no one can imagine to, uh, to eliminate it without losing a lot of the many advantages that it encompasses. Uh, but in what we called, uh, what Rathenau called the mechanization of the world, we have uh, good and uh, bad results. Uh, but what is uh, important, I think, is uh, to have the idea that this theme of the, the relationship between uh, uh, technocracy and uh, and. Uh, uh, politics uh, or, uh, and, uh, and law, uh, there is something problematic. Hugo said before something around this subject, uh, he enlightened the, the, the problematic relationship with the culture, but uh, there is a lot to reflect. Uh, and, and in fact, there is a, a lot of literature around this, uh, this theme. Uh, uh, what uh, these questions, uh, this problem, uh, uh, why this problem is problematic is because uh, uh, not only uh, there is uh, uh, lacking uh, democratic accountability, but also the idea that uh, there can be something like technocracy conceived as uh, it means uh, as a source of automatic uh, solutions uh, for every kind of problem uh, that can eliminate a political look on, uh, on the questions uh, and then can uh, uh, legi be legitimated only uh, because of the possession of expert technical knowledge and skills. Uh, so there is a, a this idea, very dangerous, that can be uh, that technocracy is a form of power above public scrutiny. Uh, this calm assumption of authority by expertise uh, at the top leads uh, to a potentially dangerous perception uh, of it as almost a form of automatic truth. And almost by default. And this idea was extremely winning in the European uh, scenario. Uh, technocrats have another characteristic. Uh, 
because two expertise assumed to be in scarce supply, they appear as a restricted elitistic group dominating a closed market. They resemble a sort of club and oligarchy quite distant from popular opinion, which admits only very favored few and is immune from democratic pressures. The fact of being immune from, uh, from uh, democratic pressures is uh, the, a virtue, but is a, a big defect at the same time. And once again, the problematic and also the ambivalence of the technocracy comes, uh, uh, comes uh, um, uh, uh, becomes evident. But why did Europe choose technocracy? Because there was an explicit choice in this sense. Uh, a European Union administered by a technocratic form of governance was, uh, I'm citing Joseph Weiler, not designed for political accountability. Uh, once again, this can be a paradox. Why Europe, the land where the modern uh, politics was invented, uh, wanted to escape from politics? using expertise as a level for increasing the legitimacy of the European institutions. This was the project. So uh, almost a plan of surrogacy expertise uh, uh, instead than politics. And uh, as suggested by Martin Shapiro in a very, I found a very interesting uh, contribution that probably some of you uh, know, the European choice from, uh, techno uh, um, uh, for technocracy was quite different from uh, the US choice made when uh, there was uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which was the time when uh, a form of technocracy uh, was uh, uh, launched in the United States with uh, a new prestige because uh, there was uh, this myth of the uh, le teste d'uovo, egg heads. Uh, so this was a, a, a call for a new kind of expertise that was absent in the American government, but that there happened under the strong political guidance by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then there was a second important difference, and that was the, the legal uh, scrutiny made in courts, because uh, uh, that kind of technocracy many times was object of uh, some uh, uh, some uh, legal, uh, uh, of some legal, um, come si può dire, uh, legal supervision by courts. Uh, and uh, this was very, very important because uh, uh, in courts uh, there was uh, also a sort of mise en scène uh, of uh, the contradiction between different or among different kind of uh, legal uh, or technical expertise. So any idea of uh, uh, objectivity of legal expertise was, uh, was cancelled or was uh, uh, in doubt because of this uh, misunderstanding. So it was uh, uh, very important because uh, especially when there was a, a in an interest group litigation that uh, uh, many times arrived uh, uh, because uh, of the, um, the attitude of these groups. Uh, when there was this kind of litigation, uh, everyone called its own experts, and these experts were uh, contradicted each other. 
uh, nothing of this happened in the European scene. Uh, we don't have, uh, we didn't have a political guidance. We didn't have a, a, poli a, a legal supervision by courts. So uh, we can say that uh, what we uh, are used to call with uh, a nice nickname, comitology, uh, which make uh, more, uh, more pleasant the idea of these committees, uh, uh, in Europe uh, was much uh, uh, unchallenged. Of course, when we speak of technocracy, we are, speak, we are speaking also of a form of uh, governance by professions, which means that these people respond not to a political audience, but to technical and a technical audience. The delegated te technocrats are not responsive, uh, neither to national political audiences. Sometimes in the literature, uh, we find the idea that uh, these, are, these people are representative of different uh, nations. But uh, that's not true, or because uh, uh, in reality, they represent uh, a kind of uh, doctrine science, uh, which is, uh, in, many in many cases, uh, uh, fashionable. Uh, it's uh, in fashion in that moment, uh, and uh, in any case, uh, is uh, transnational. So, uh, this, uh, this idea, too, uh, is, not, uh, is not true, and uh, these people, uh, um, uh, speak in, uh, in the name of fashionable theories, credos, doctrines. Uh, I, don't, I don't say that they don't, they, they uh, always say uh, stupid things, but uh, uh, the idea that they are, uh, some, they are saying some form of truth is really um, to, be, um, to be contrasted. Uh, there was another form of uh, surrogacy working at the political level in Europe. Uh, uh, another form because uh, um, we can find replicated this idea uh, of the surrogacy also at uh, a legal level uh, as the role played by the European Court of Justice uh, as a true champion of uh, legal protagonism was uh, uh, really something uh, uh, going in this direction, as I would say at the end of my, of my speech. Now, which is the Europe's legal culture? Because we are speaking of this now. Uh, the title given to this, uh, to this meeting uh, the culture of, uh, of um, techno the, the, the legal culture of European technocracy seems to be an answer to my question. Uh, there is not a, uni a unitary legal culture in, in Europe. This is my idea, at least. Uh, past, past decades have been uh, decades of strong uh, restructuration of uh, legal institutions uh, with obvious effects uh, on the legal culture as well. For example, uh, uh, there was the idea in the past, uh, this idea was uh, by Lawrence Friedman, that there was uh, an internal uh, legal culture in each country and an external legal culture this idea now is uh, quite uh, uh, weak because uh, uh, everyone knows uh, how many forms of uh, exchange between in interior and external uh, culture there are, how many spontaneous or not borrowing, how many forms of interiorization of legal, of external legal suggestions, and so on. So this, uh, 
this border, uh, internal, external, is very, very uncertain. Uh, for many years, we had this idea in the Comparatist too, because uh, of the idea of legal families, uh, which was uh, um, around uh, some uh, uh, very, um, very hard characteristic judge made law on one side and legislative law on the other one, on the statutes, statute law on the other side. But uh, uh, also on this level, we know how many changes we, we had. So a lot of things say that uh, we are not in that kind of, uh, of uh, old environment uh, and the idea uh, Notwithstanding all these differences, uh, the idea of a unitary uh, legal culture was accredited many times. Uh, probably uh, that was uh, also the, uh, the will to create it that uh, fostered it. The idea of a uh, unitary legal, European legal culture was accredited as uh, uh, on the basis of common roots and uh, traditions going back to the use commune uh, heritage uh, and so on. But I think it's uh, better to say that uh, this is an hard product to reach and uh, for the moment I would be uh, more uh, prudent uh, saying that uh, uh, probably we can say that there are different kinds of legal culture in Europe. I will try to sketch three kinds of legal culture. Uh, and uh, these uh, different legal, created by different uh, legal communication and discourses that there were on the Europe in the European stage. Uh, and each of these uh, communication, these uh, debates, had its own uh, target and was addressed to its own uh, end. Mm, we can speak at least of three uh, different discourses. The first one maybe is uh, uh, the discourse on uh, the integration, of the European integration. Uh, we are here celebrating the Common Core uh, project uh, 20 years after, so I don't need to, uh, to say anything on this subject because uh, uh, this project was one of the manifestation of the, uh, the idea that uh, Europe could define its own roots and uh, needed uh, some research in this direction was needed. And probably what uh, the Common Core project was for private law uh, the research project directed by Cappelletti, Secombens, Weiler on integration through law was for public law. Uh, however, notwithstanding the centrality of the reference to the dynamics of integration, uh, probably, um, as um, some have recognized, uh, the theme of the legal culture accompanying this discourse was, uh, was not so considered, was not, uh, did not receive much attention in Europe. A second plan, a second discourse that uh, uh, created uh, uh, probably a, a, a consequent culture was uh, uh, the debate on uh, the issue of rights. Uh, which had uh, very important effects on legal culture. Uh, molding a framework of Europe or European constitutionalism that could become a model for the world as well. Now, in the first aspect, uh, there was a functionalist uh, uh, um, twist of the discourse because uh, uh, the legal institution and also the communication was intended to reach a result, that of the integration. In this second aspect, uh, around the constitution, the rights and so on, the plan was different, was the idea of uh, a European identity. So very, very important. Uh, and uh, 
this culture reached its peak when uh, uh, the so-called treaty establishing a constitution for, for Europe uh, uh, was presented, uh, but it did not disappear after uh, that the project was uh, rejected by uh, the French and Dutch voters. Uh, the debates uh, live on, uh, found a watered uh, version in the Lisbon uh, Treaty uh, that came into effect in two, 2009, and uh, still uh, this can be uh, the idea of a European identity and constitution. Thirdly, there is a less known uh, legal culture emerging from the idea and practice of economic integration in the global market, which was a different plan from the first one because the first one, as I said, was intended to reach an integration. It was more uh, for the public law. This one, uh, this third one was, was more for the, the first law intended to become the law for all, substituting, in a certain sense, the public law. Uh, this integration was not only integration among different states within the European borders, but it was the, 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 the idea of a link that Europe wanted to establish with the wider global economy. This time Europe played on the plan of differentiation, not of, of simulation. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, sorry, for uh, this time uh, Europe uh, was um, intending to find a distinctive, uh, not a distinctive character of union, but uh, a similar character with the, the one of the, the global economy heavily influenced by neoliberal ideas. Uh, of course, these three kinds of uh, culture that I've uh, so uh, badly uh, sketched are far from finished products, uh, ready to bring their influence on uh, effective life. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, some very rudimental uh, uh, ideas, but uh, um, in every case uh, they have uh, an influence in shaping uh, the actions and are shaped by the actions that happen in the real life. But I, I think uh, that they have to be considered uh, especially on an analytical uh, plan. Uh, in any case, uh, this uh, um, uh, the contacts that uh, there are among these three different plans uh, are not enough to justify the idea of a unitary uh, legal culture. And that's why, uh, uh, I mean, a legal order characterized by stable general principle and formal rights uh, and so on. Uh, and I will, I will explain why uh, later. Uh, but let me tell something more on the relationship between law and technique or law and expertise. Hugo said before, uh, then uh, in your uh, story, law was perceived especially as a mostly technical means, which is true, and uh, mm, Apparently, there is no visible conflict between law and technical expertise, as I said before. The technicalization of law is not a new subject, is an old project and has a long pedigree. Once again, Europe is in leading position on this, uh, on this plan with its attempt uh, to make legal positivism a way 
to transform law in a perfect technical means uh, that can reach uh, uh, the result that can respond to a scientific criteria and so on. Uh, Kelsen legal positivism envisages law as a, technic, a social technique. Um, at the same time, technicalization of law could be seen as a form of truth uh, because uh, uh, there is the building of uh, a science of law. But is this portrait of the law that uh, uh, Max Weber also envisaged as the fittest for responding to the needs of capitalism, still the fittest model for today's capitalism? I think we can find uh, uh, a surprise because the uh, story went in a very different direction than the, the one predicted by Max Weber. Uh, we have uh, a story in the last decades of a growing deformalization of law and its paraphernalia following a pattern sketched by doctrines of law and economics uh, and especially by neo-institutionalist uh, uh, economists. Uh, this preconized uh, a large number of legal solutions, uh, Hugo said before, uh, so that each one could, uh, uh, individuals and companies could have uh, its own means to pick up and to choose. In other terms, we had a very significant process of legal liberalization, which parallels the great process of uh, economic liberalization. There is a perfect uh, uh, parallelism between the two. Uh, but today, technicalization of law does not anymore implies the standardization of legal responses. Uh, because efficiency is the new, the new uh, aim of the law, and it's supposed that laws produce efficiency, uh, uh, it, uh, it is uh, needed a a number, a large number of legal solutions, uh, each one is the fittest for reaching this result. And we can find uh, two essential paths to which uh, this result uh, could be reached. And both of them are respond to a, a strategy of deformalization. On the first uh, is, uh, uh, on one hand, we have legal solutions that come from the past, from history, especially from European history, and that uh, a, a scholar uh, emphasized with these, uh, uh, these uh, very simple words, hidden hands, habits, patents, behavior, and cultural moves. Uh, it's Austin, the author, one of the author of that uh, classic book that is uh, governance without government. Uh, old ways, even pre-modern ways, uh, legal means, such as the Lex Mercatoria, enjoyed a, a renewed life, uh, once again separated by state from states and from democratic control. On the other hand, we had a strategy of legal uh, differentiation regarding uh, legal means that were uh, familiar to the state as contract, as uh, judicial law, which were deformalized, privatized at their turn. Uh, because, as I said, uh, for example, Williamson, legal centralism was unfit to achieve efficiency, 
the literature on transitional costs in general upheld the idea that even typical contractual forms and the judicial process are unfit for achieving efficiency. So the, the model was the same, but it was uh, arranged in so many different and private ways that it could seem the same things, but it was just uh, something very, very different. Okay. So instead of predicting in advance uh, all the possible legal solutions, uh, it is preferable to leave people free to choose the solution at the moment. So not uniform legal devices and solutions, but a plurality of devices and alternative solutions. Not public law, but private law outlined by private subjects. Not tribunals, but arbitration houses and centers of mediation and conciliation not typical, but atypical contracts. So both these two transformative paths responding to the idea of what Paolo Grossi calls diritto factuale, factual law, and uh, uh, the second one, uh, this process of deformalization of what was uh, typical and formal, uh, went together and shaped the legal culture that, is, uh, that we can suppose this is uh, uh, typical of the European technocracy and up to the global markets as well. This world of alternative legal devices and forums uh, and private law molded uh, especially by uh, big law firms, uh, is the legal environment of technocracy. Whatever European or otherwise, uh, it betrays itself all too clearly with the same global vocabulary and mentality. Efficiency, not social justice, is the pole star of this legal culture. But so far, I've, uh, I've neglected uh, one, uh, one actor which is uh, very important, which has been very important in Europe, the European Court and especially the European Court of Ju the European Courts and especially the European Court of Justice. This was the first and essential engine of the European integration, working as a true master of the treaty. This was an astonishing uh, case of successful uh, judicial governance uh, in a country, in a land, in a culture that was quite aside from the tradition of judge-made law. Uh, even more important was the success reached by this court in the field of uh, uh, a constitutional identity of Europe, but this constitutional uh, identity was essentially around uh, human rights, leaving away the long heritage of social rights in Europe. And then finally, courts imposed to European states a culture of economic rights that was quite disconnected from social considerations, and that was really new for Europe, showing an attitude to be well connected with the liberal, neoliberal mood. So fostering a revival of formalism in law that is typical of, this, uh, of our age, uh, that wants to use uh, law uh, in a formal way without restriction coming from political reasons. I want to, to close with uh, the, uh, remembering some uh, words uh, um, that, I, um, that Weil, uh, Joseph Weiler wrote uh, saying that uh, uh, Europe, the European Court fundamentally posits an individual vindicating, uh, uh, poses uh, a culture that um, 
is uh, around a vindication, a, uh, an individual vindicating a personal private interest against the public good. Paradoxically, European rights in some interesting way became anti-community rights. This comment illustrates very well how the constitutional phase of Europe perfectly overlaps the economic phase and both these, uh, these facets. Uh, too many parts party in comedy, as we say in Italy, too many roles played in the same comedy by the European Court of Justice. To play so many roles was a proof of great bravura, but at cost of so many inconsistency and breaks in the European story of solidarity and social rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Rosaria. This was a very, very interesting discussion of the context and of the main actors uh, of, uh, of this story. And so now the floor is to Professor Schneider. Please, you have the floor. So, can I turn on my PowerPoint over there? I'm not sure how to do it. Ah, oh, great. Antonio will do the magic. That's it, thank you, Mr. Grazie. So I would like to start by thanking Ugo Mattei and Mauro Bassani for the invitation, uh, especially because this topic seems more like a public law, more like an international law topic, uh, and um, part of my role here is to show that, in fact, it is a central topic of the Common Core. I also like to thank the property group uh, for allowing me to sit in this morning. I used to teach property law many years ago, and I learned a lot from the discussion today. So my, I have three, uh, three purposes uh, this afternoon. The first one is to introduce international relations to the Common Core project. I saw from the website there's some work going on on this, but this is another element. Secondly to introduce the talk, topic of bilateral investment treaties, or BITS, into the discussion. This is a very hot topic now. I assume no knowledge of this, and I will present some basic facts. And the third uh, purpose is uh, to introduce the legal culture of the European technocracy regarding international negotiations with China. And so you can see the topic LSET and the EU PRC bit, or the legal culture of European technocracy as reflected in EU negotiations with China. Now the test of the technology, it works. So the other day on French TV, we had a very long report on the fact that the Chinese may be taking over Toulouse Blagnac Airport. And so you can see here, I hope, that this is the sixth largest airport in France, currently owned by the French government, up to 49.9%. But the government somehow could sell 10% more, I assume, by leaning on the local authorities. The bidding consortium, which has produced a bid 20% higher than uh, Paris Airport, or Vinci, which owns the Autostrada in the south of France, is a consortium consisting of a Hong Kong company, Shandong, which is a province in China, investment fund, Shenzhen Airport, Shenzhen is where I live. It's a city of about 15 to 20 million now, um, and a Canadian firm. The basic facts, some basic facts, is that the airport is right next to the Airbus plant. Secondly, the Friedman Pacific in Hong Kong is a main shareholder of China Aircraft Leasing Company, which just bought 100 Airbus worth 10.2 US, million US dollars, uh, and it holds 20% of the Chinese airplane leasing market exclusively with Airbus. And then maybe by comparison, uh, Paris Airport invested in Beijing, 
up to the tune of about 10% of the capital a few years ago. And as you all probably know much better than I do, Etihad from Abu Dhabi bought 49% of Alitalia again a few years ago. So my plan uh, is, it, it looks like this. I, I will not have time to go through all the slides, so please be patient if I pick and choose. First, some introduction, definition, scope, and argument. I insert that because when I decided to work on this topic, uh, I was confronted with what does legal culture mean and what does legal European technocracy mean. So I've adopted my own definitions. Uh, secondly, what are the typical contents of these bilateral investment agreements? Third, something about the current negotiations. And fourth, changes on, underway on the European side and on the Chinese side. And I have tried to keep in mind legal culture of European technocracy as I've worked through these. And so first, introduction and some definitions. Uh, this is my working definition of LSET, the legal culture of European technocracy. Uh, I just, I don't know, I woke up one morning and I ran to the computer and I wrote this down. Sometimes you're better off working when you're half asleep than you are when you're fully awake. So maybe. So legal culture, LSET, the intellectual framework and the craft knowledge embracing law in the broad sense deployed consciously or unconsciously by EU civil servants, functionnaires, and other staff of the institutions, the commissioners, the European Council, the Council of Ministers, and I've also included, included members of the European Parliament because these are the people who, in the committees, for example, are experts. Secondly, you can see that this is not limited to domestic law. I'm trying to deploy this argument in relation to international negotiations. And then the bit, this is a, a definition I've made up from some of the literature, international treaty between two or more trading partners setting out rights, obligations, procedures, and so on regarding FDI, or foreign direct investment. So my argument here, and I've tried to go on the theory that I might have had only 10 minutes to give my talk, so I should get the argument out front first. Um, and so <laughs> I put it first. So the argument, first of all, that LSET, the legal culture of European technology, is not limited to the domestic legal field. It's also involved in international relations, including these negotiations. Uh, however, LSET in the negotiations for a bilateral investment treaty with China or other countries shares common features with LSET in other policy areas, maybe agriculture or high tech and domestic scene or economic integration and so on. But there are special, there are certain specific features which so far I would trace to the conjunction of external relations as a policy area, international negotiations as a specific activity, and relations with China, which includes negotiations, but of course many, many other elements. And this is still in development because of recent excuse me, policies on the EU side and also on the Chinese side, which are likely to shape What's this. What the end of FDI mean? What? Oh, FDI, Foreign Direct Investment. Okay, FDI, FDI? Uh, TL? Oh, Treaty of Lisbon. Okay, good. good. I'm trying to get it all on one page, yeah. so. No, no, it's okay. Just so go. please, um, I'll try to be clear about the abbreviation. So Treaty of Lisbon, TL, FDI, foreign and direct investment, sometimes C for China, and BIT for bilateral investment treaty. And now, what is a BIT? Uh, bilateral investment treaty includes typically a number of different areas, and I, I will, if you don't mind, I'll just run through these without any detail, and so you give you, you get a general idea of what they're about. One is, these are all international agreements regulating relations between two, uh, between, uh, two governments. But of course, the hidden party is usually the multinational company 
which is making the investment. And that's the party which is concerned by these provisions. Uh, fair and equi equitable treatment, national treatment, national treatment, which is a term which comes from trade law, particularly w WTO law, which means that a foreign company should be treated exactly the same as a domestic company. It's a non-discrimination provision. So here there are two parts. One is pre-establishment, that's market access in the European Parliament jargon. It means can a foreign company get into the market? And then post-establishment means once a company is in the market, is it treated just like a domestic company? Most favored nation also comes from WTO law, World Trade Organization law, and it means that a, co a country has to treat, treat all its trading partners equally. So any advantage it gives to one trading partner has to be multilateralized and extended to all trading partners. And then performance requirements refers to things like transfer of technology. If an Italian company, for example, Fiat, invests in China, does it have to transfer to the Chinese partner all of its technology? Uh, other performance requirements may be a promise to export as much as you import, and so on. And then comes the pr some other problems. What about expropriation? Well, there are two types of expropriation. The most tricky one and the most interesting one is what's called indirect regulatory expropriation. So when we had the discussion this morning about the commons and property rights, this leapt immediately to my mind because here is the zone of protection of public goods or, pri or, or commons against private rights, private rights by the multinational company. And then dispute settlement and then sustainable development. That's a general picture of what these look like. Well, what about the legal culture of European uh, technocracy, taken broadly in the way I've defined the group? One prudent, prudent optimism that negotiation can produce a deal favorable to the EU, to the EU member states and to EU business. And I also should add uh, citizens and residents to that uh, PowerPoint. Max, the EU wants maximum non-discrimination. It wants to be treated better than any other partner of China, for example, the United States, and of course on the same footing as Chinese companies. The EU, uh, following its, uh, its bias, one can say, is very much in favor of open markets, and a reduced role of the state. And so, for example, it wants market access or pre-establishment national treatment, no performance requirements, and so on. The EU, on the whole, does not trust the Chinese judicial system, so it wants easy access to international arbitration if there is a problem. It also wants to include sustainable development, environment, labor issues, human rights issues, maybe, uh, in that. And we can see that these are all values which are stated in the Lisbon Treaty, which have basically been extrapolated into this new policy arena. So look at the current negotiations. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the background. EU Commission, uh, the European Commission said in 2006, in a communication about China, in two communications, in fact, that the EU's biggest trade challenge was relations with China. And here you can see some statistics, increase in the deficit, but here one has to keep in mind that the economists tell us that the trade between EU and East Asia, or Asia, has been relatively stable for years. What's happened is that China has become an export platform, particularly where I live in Shenzhen, which is the home of the Chinese miracle. And so instead of products being exported from Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, they all come through China, and they're labeled made in China, even though the value added in China may not be 
so tr tremendous. It's a question of the rules of origin. But also we see that EU foreign investment in China is only 2% of EU world foreign direct investment. And uh, China, really the same on the same side, China FDI and the EU is uh, only uh, 25 or at the most percent of total inward FDI. That means money coming from China into the EU. And then another point which to keep in mind is that EU-China relations so far have been mainly relations between China and member states, particularly Germany and also UK. And so Germany, in fact, has an equal trade balance with China. That means it imports more or less the same, as much as it exports to China. Other Europe, EU countries are not in the same position at all. Now, all of these facts have an influence on the negotiations. Negotiations were announced at the EU-China summit. That, ha that happens every year in 2012. And so far, there have been three rounds of negotiation. One has maybe to relativize the speed of negotiations because the, the Canada-China BIT took 18 years. For various reasons which may become clear, the EU one probably will not take so long. So the current negotiations, here comes LSAT again, legal culture. EU response to China trade and investment, insist on openness, level playing field, support European companies, defend EU interests first by dialogue, in other words, not like the United States by going to the World Trade Organization, and also try to build a stronger global relationship. Now, if we look at the, on both sides, the interest on both sides, they look a little bit different the EU wants to end the recession. It needs inward FDI. There's a lot of examples out there of Chinese investment in Europe so far, Portuguese insurance companies, Port of Piraeus in Greece, and so on. EU needs foreign markets, and it wants to counter the United States in its turn to Asia policy and its other um, regional trade agreements. The Chinese side, China has always since 1978 focused on domestic reform. There's a very big wave, a new wave of domestic reforms going on now. Uh, and if we look at the FDI picture, however, FDI has become very important because China, the Chinese want to change their economic model from export orientation to domestic consumption import demand, needs technology. So it, China needs inward FDI. It also, many Chinese companies are being globalized. Shenzhen is the home of Huawei, which most people will have heard of. Uh, the Chinese government has adopted a few years ago a strategy called going out strategy. And going out strategy means outward FDI in Africa, Latin America, other Asian countries as well as um, in China, of course, and in, in Europe. But one can ask, does foreign and direct investment require a bilateral investment treaty with the European Union? So that's where we turn next briefly. Does China need a bit with the EU? China's concerns are competition with European uh, companies, lack of coordination among the member states, China now prefers to deal individually with the member states because the EU does not seem to be able to get its act together in many fields. Uh, China would gain by dealing with the EU instead of different member states, but it may, uh, if things stand as they are, prefer to deal with the member states. I'm not too sure. China would gain increased soft power in the world, which it wants, and it may possibly be the model, if it signs an agreement with the EU, for these bilateral investment agreements internationally. But one can ask, does China really need an investment agreement with the EU? Chinese practice, as we will see, increasingly converges with that of the United States and of the European Union. 
Most of the rationale for these agreements, bits in the past, has been to protect investors from developed countries when they invest in developing countries, which do not have a strong legal system. Well, China already benefits from stable legal systems in the member states of the EU. And then one can ask, is Chinese investment in Europe really going to grow so rapidly? It's not too clear. Uh, my conclusion is that for China, probably this kind of agreement is more important politically than economically. And the next slide is really more of the same. Uh, my conclusion that the Chinese economic growth and relative dynamism, which is running now about 7.5 or 8% a year, will continue uh, due to restructuring domestic reforms. And China, China also can invest in Asia. It is, of course, um, uh, doing this. And it may want, however, to counterbalance the US. Well, does, does Europe need a bilateral investment meet, agreement with China? European concerns, if one reads the Commission's uh, communications and other documents, are first of all that China has a policy of fostering its national champions. Secondly, that it wants to encourage indigenous innovation. Basically, typical developing country concerns. Uh, government business relationships are alleged to be opaque. And then China has a weak judicial system despite with the beginning of reform now. So I conclude, I won't run through all this, that the, the, um, the, the bit is more important for the EU than it is for China. And so we look at the current negotiations. Key elements, market access, regulatory expropriation, dispute settlement, and I, I'm not going to go through all of, all of these, just a couple of basic points. First, EU and China have the majority of bilateral investment agreements in the world. EU together, the member states, have a total of 1,400. China has 130. The world total seems to be about 2,500. And on the EU side, you can see that the 27 of the 28 member states have bits with China. They're not all the same, of course. That's why the EU adopted this transitional regulation, as I've called it. And then I'll look at some of the other elements. Uh, on the Chinese side, the main points to take away there are that the past practice has been very restrictive of foreign investment, but now there are current reforms which promise to be make a lot of changes, and even lead to a convergence of, to the same technocratic legal culture, even though that may sound a bit strange, and it leaves a lot of questions unanswered, of course. So on both sides, a number of changes. Some of them we, we know very well. With the Treaty of Lisbon, the European Union got exclusive competence uh, for foreign direct investment as part of its uniform common commercial policy. And I will, I'll go, I'll just go through these here. The competence to Article 206 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Uh, a lot of debate about what is included in FDI, what does it mean, and so on. I'll skip over this. Also, the negotiation procedure. And then, what does it tell us about LSET? L said, what does, how can the Treaty of Lisbon be a window? Well, there one has to take the law seriously, which sometimes is a useful thing to do. Uh, and so here's the articles of the Treaty of Lisbon, which talks about elements which are related to legal culture of European technocracy. Uh, and for example, international action to be guided by EU principles, democracy, rule of law, universality of human rights, respect for human dignity, equality and solidarity, and so on. A number of, a lot of repetitions there. EU then adopted in 2012 uh, what is called the transitional regulation. 
The idea here is that there are a number of, as we saw, 1,400 bits out there adopted by 27 member states. They are very different. How can they be brought together, harmonized, or at least try to avoid conflict and eventually possibly be replaced by an EU single model bit, if that is possible? Well, you can see the basic standard techniques are being used here. For example, um, notify the European Commission, duty of cooperation by the member states, authorization by the Commission to negotiate amendments uh, to existing agreements or conclude new ones, EU bits gradually to replace the member states one. Maybe this is a hope on the part of the technocracy, technocracy which will never be realized. An advisory committee, this is the comatology, uh, basically comatology procedure. And so if we look here and we look at the last part, what does it tell us about the LSAT, the legal culture of European technocracy? Well, one feature here, of course, is Europeanization and integration. Gradual transition, technique of notification, transparency. Of course, the transparency is in favor of the European Union. Europe, EU obligations apply to the member states during the transitional period. Use of advisory committee. These are all very well-known, well-worn aspects of EU law in other, other fields. More interesting, perhaps, and specific to the bilateral investment treaty world is that the EU and the United States have agreed on these shared principles for international investment. These are not legally binding. This is soft law. One assumes that it will guide the EU as the United States in developing a model bit on each side and also in the negotiations. So you, it, some of it looks, well, it looks familiar. Broad market access, put SOEs, state-owned enterprises, and private firms on a level playing field. Compensation, adequate, prompt, effective compensation. Arbitration that is open and transparent with agreed public participation. High level of transparency and public participation in domestic lawmaking. Multinational companies, MNCs, to operate in a socially responsible manner. And national security review on each side, on the Chinese side and on the EU side, to focus only on real security risks. So then we look at the Chinese law until recently and I'm coming up to my conclusion very soon. China had a, a typical developing country profile, although its economic, its economic uh, strength and its political system allowed it basically to, to dictate its rules to companies and countries which wanted to get into the Chinese market. It had a catalog for foreign direct investment. This is a law. It divided FDI into encouraged sectors, restricted sectors, and prohibited sectors. FDI had to take the certain specific forms of a foreign investment enterprise. It had to be an equity joint venture, or where the European side contributed uh, the money, for example, the Chinese side contributed the land, the factory, and the workers, or a cooperative joint venture, or what the Chinese called WUFI. WUFI is a wholly foreign-owned enterprise. Wholly foreign-owned enterprise, but it's a foreign-owned enterprise registered as an FIE under Chinese law and approved by the Ministry of Commerce or at a lower level of the government. If the MOFCOM and the Ministry of Commerce did not approve, there's nothing you can do. And the Ministry of Commerce could impose conditions including such as transfer of technology. There was a fascinating article in Le Monde uh, last year, I think when uh, Peugeot was wondering whether it should invest in China, uh, which they did eventually, and, uh, and saying, well, if we don't invest in China, we're going to sink. We're going bankrupt. If we do invest in China, we'll have to give away our technology, which is better. They invested in China with a company called Dongfeng, uh, East Wind, which is in Chengdu, it's in the west of China, rapidly developing 
uh, city. And so uh, to give you an example of the bad side of this previous policy, one could look at the agreement between China and Canada. So <clears throat> some, some elements here. The first one, no national tree, but no market access, really. China could prefer its own companies. Performance requirements at the level of the WTO agreement on trade-related uh, investment measures called TRIMS. And you can see there that technology transfer restrictions were allowed. Under American law rules, they are not allowed. Uh, and then the government encouraged but not required to publish and allow content, comment on new measures. Now in China, all major legislation is published. It's published in time for comment on the internet or e email or whatever it may be. Uh, but it's not up to uh, standards that the EU would consider to be adequate. And then arbitration, you can see this, would be private unless the one state agree. Well, what is happening now um, in China it makes the picture uh, in possibly look potentially look very different indeed because China is negotiating not only with the EU but is also with the United States. Many people say that Canada concluded its agreement at the wrong time before the, the Chinese reforms had really come to fruition. So the current Chinese position is market access, pre-establishment national treatment, a negative list, you know, the areas where you cannot not uh, um, invest. Chinese have set up a pilot free trade zone in Shanghai. Uh, they've made several decisions to increase market access. Uh, let's see what else. Ab abolish the investment catalog, the approval system, uh, and, and so on. So I come to my conclusion, and I have about eight minutes left. And so my conclusion is to return to the LSAT. What does all this tell us about the legal culture of European technocracy? I think the first, the first element is to say that LSAT is shaped by EU features. We already heard uh, a lot of these. These add to what Professor Faraesi has just mentioned. EU is important economically, but politically, as many political scientists tell us, it is a medium-sized power. What are its negotiating strengths? Secondly, EU, as described by many political scientists, is not a government, it's a negotiating system. Does that mean it is weak compared to a large sovereign state? EU is a divided power system. But can the member states agree? And if one looks at the transitional regulation and some of the literature I've started to go through more systematically, there's a lot of room for doubt. To what extent can the EU deal with member states' different interests? Uh, my, invent my invented phrase about this is, globalization strengthens China but weakens the European Union. Now, I have to think about this. That's why I wrote, Considered why. consider why. Why does the EU need the BIT more than China? What does this tell us about legal culture of the European uh, technocracy? There's a very well-known report about EU-China relations produced by the European Council on Foreign Relations, which said, formerly the Europeans considered themselves superior to the Chinese not only culturally, but politically and economically. Now this is, this is ridiculous. Uh, it needs to change. This does not mean one has to adopt the Chinese position, uh, which is equally ethnocentric, but it means that if the EU is going to make some progress, there needs to be some rethinking on the part of the European technocracy. Now, secondly, LSAT is shaped by some features of its own internal features, one might say. First of all, it's elite, it's diverse, it is not all technocratic. For example, the people in the European Parliament are not all technocrats. Secondly, Europe has, I suppose, technical expertise in international negotiations, but compared to the United States, 
It has very little expertise on China. Also, we know there's conflict, tension, within the technocratic community between trade orientation and human rights orientation. Also, between strong market access, for example, the parliament, and deepening of existing trade relations. And then working relations with member states, obviously different member states are in a different situation. And I've added here, and it's not on the slide, German dominance, trade balance, politically friendly, more FDI, more China expertise. One can only, one can look at, for example, the recent anti-dumping cases for evidence of that. And then finally, LSAT is shaped by context-specific features, and I've reordered, I've reordered some of these. Uh, rhetorically, the EU often, if not usually, follows the United States, for example, in these principles about investment, but it's less confrontational I wonder whether in practice the EU will be able to improve on the Canada-China BIT. If so, it will be because of the reforms going on in China. What about security review? Here the European Union has not been as touchy as the United States. Huawei and another, other examples show this. China has a method of focusing on common interests and setting aside differences. This is how the Chinese work. Can the EU accept this? China will gain, if there's a BIT, uh, in soft power. Uh, would the EU like this? It will be part of the bargain. And then the key elements in these bits are market access, indirect expropriation, and dispute settlement. In some of those, particularly the one about con the commons, I think the EU and China have common interests, for example, in indirect expropriation, in ring fencing public policies from challenges by private investors, for example, public policies about the environment, or about food safety, or about water, or could be, could be, could be, and could be anything. But we lawyers know the devil is in the details, and so maybe there may be, there may, could be common interest in general, but in the negotiations it may not be so obvious. And then finally, China has a timetable reform. The EU has to be very careful that it takes account of this. And so I end with some questions and hypotheses. One element is not here. One element is, it seems that the United States is the leader. Both the EU and China want to be the leader in creating a model BIT which will be accepted by the rest of the world. We'll see how this works out. Secondly, if, as I see it, the EU and the Chinese starting points for negotiation are converging together with the US position, does that mean that the European technocracy legal culture and the Chinese technocracy legal culture are converging in certain respects and in certain contexts to be defined? This sounds like the product specific uh, uh, element, you know, in the, in the medical, uh, medical products regulatory regime. So I, my hypothesis is yes, they are converging in certain respects and in certain contexts which are to be defined. And that's obviously an invitation for future research. Secondly, does this mean that it's more useful to analyze legal cultures, at least technocracy legal cultures, in terms of a social or legal field instead of a, a national or regional integration scheme, territorial boundary? My view is yes. It's more useful to analyze these in terms of social and legal field. I have not done this, that's why it's a hypothesis. And then several questions. Uh, which are on your on the on the slide, but not on this printed version. One issue is how do these legal cultures of the European technocracy, to stick to the European side, relate to other legal cultures? 
in the same area, for example, in Spain or Italy or, or, or France. And this is partly referring to Lawrence Friedman's distinction between internal and external legal cultures. But if we say this distinction is really out of date, the picture now is much more complicated. The general question of how are these technocracy legal cultures related to other legal cultures uh, remains. And then, well, you, th there's another element about translation. I've always been very interested in translation. So when I see these international agreements and international negotiations, I ask myself, how are these going to be translated into local legal cultures? And as we all know, in translations, many things are lost. And this is likely to be the case here. So I, I've tried to reflect on this maybe rather strange beast, the bit and external relations and ask what is the legal culture of European uh, technocracy. So, thank you very much. Thanks so much for this really very, very interesting reflection on, 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 on uh, what's really going on. So thanks so much. Um, I guess now the floor is open. If there are questions or remarks or any one of the three papers that were presented, and this is the moment to speak. Yes, please, Professor Page. Yes, uh, I'd like to comment on uh, Rich, uh, Richard Goldberg's presentation, um, and I'd also like to uh, utilize the, the common core methodology here of uh, law on the ground, but I'm going to talk about regulation on the ground and things moving from, from the bottom up rather than from the top bottom, uh, and give you uh, some comments on the issue of technology and democracy. And I'm going to use as an example a controversy that's uh, broken out in the United States relating to uh, access to unapproved new drugs. Uh, you may know that in the United States, the marketing of new drugs is, is, is governed by the, a federal agency, the Food and Drug Administration, which has the authority to, uh, for pre-market review. And the pre-market review is based on both safety and efficacy. And it, the companies have to go through testing in, the, in the three uh, phases. The first phase is our animal chemical tests and animal tests to see whether uh, w w what the risks might be, and then you don't get into clinical testing, cl testing on human beings until phase two and phase three. Uh, now, uh, what happened? To, well, the problem that's arising now had its roots with the AIDS crisis in the beginning uh, in the 1980s, when a large number of people were uh, were dying from this uh, dreadful disease, and there were really no drugs that treated it, and so there were were attempts made to develop treatments, medical treatments for uh, for the AIDS virus. And, uh, and of course, in order for these drugs to be marketed, they had to go through the Food and Drug Administration approval process, uh, which takes time. And so there was a tremendous amount of political agitation from uh, AIDS groups, both the sufferers and sufferers' friends, uh, uh, to families and friends, uh, to pressure the F Food and Drug Administration for early access to drug these dr drugs that were being developed to treat this life-threatening disease. And they did manage to get the Food and Drug Administration to reform its process in order to grant expedited review to get these drugs available to people more quickly. Uh, but now what's happened is that there's a, a renewed and increasing pressure in the United States uh, to, ha to let people with life-threatening diseases uh, to have access to drugs that have gone through only the phase one process but have never been tested on, on human beings. Uh, the, tech, the technocracy at the Food and Drug Administration, of course, uh, is resisting this, saying that they have early access procedures, but if, uh, uh, if they allow uh, drugs to go on the market at this early stage, we don't know whether they're safe, we don't really know whether they're effective, uh, and we can't find out unless we do these 
tests that we run, and uh, if we grant early access, then nobody with these life-threatening diseases is going to want to go through the tests because you might be getting the sugar-coated pills. You want access to the actual drugs. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there are libertarian political move, uh, uh, st strains in the United States that don't want government regulation of anything at all, and so they're uh, supporting uh, all this. So right now in the states, we have individual states that are having, uh, that are passing laws or having referenda that result in the passage of legislation that allow for the early, early access to uh, unapproved uh, new drugs in direct conflict uh, with the uh, technocracy uh, that wants to maintain at least some semblance of a scientific review process uh, for these drugs. So now we have a conflict here between the technocrats and democracy. We have a conflict uh, between people who have, the, have these life-threatening diseases now and are de desperate for some kind of treatment on the one hand, uh, versus the people who five years or 10 years from now will get these same diseases uh, because uh, uh, if, if you allow early access, you're going to make it very difficult to find out what you need to find out uh, about these drugs. Uh, so wh what you have here is a conflict between the technica technocrats uh, and, and the democratic process. So I guess my only point here is to give an example from the ground to show that this issue can be very messy. And I don't think that there, uh, there, that there are any e uh, easy answers. And I think uh, this is one of the uh, really impenetrable conundra that, that, uh, that you get at. And uh, I, for, I, I would be interested in knowing how, how would you come out on this uh, as between the position of the technocrats and the position, uh, the democratic position uh, of uh, people who want access to these drugs. Excuse me. Uh, does, are you referring also to Ebola as well as no, AIDS? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I think it's. I mean, I, I think I think your problem actually is is excellent because it shows the dilemmas that exist in this particular area. Um, one of the things I think I mentioned was, yes, there is some justification for a technocracy. And I think that is even accepted by people who <coughs> support participation by patient uh, agencies and organizations, including those that want early access um, to patients um, to medication, and, and including those who are, who are trying to support those who are who are terminally ill, for instance, and who want access. But the difficulty, of course, lies there with the fact that some of that promotion, which is going on in relationship to the very drugs in question that you are talking about, is potentially through the industry itself. There is an element of an unholy alliance between some representations of patient activation and those within the industry who want the drugs on the market, notwithstanding the fact that their efficacy has not, in fact, been established. Um, and that's one of the fears that I think we have in this process. Um, the flexibility introduced as a result of the AIDS crisis was a good thing, um, but that should not be allowed to distract from the fact that efficacy is important, that so many of these drugs are being challenged as being non-efficacious, that the clinical trials that have taken place have tended to take place, uh, that studies uh, in relationship to efficacy have taken place in relationship to placebos, and that n it could well be the case that the drugs in question that you're talking about, if they went through the regulatory procedure, would actually be shown to be non-beneficial in the long term. And that's really the concern. So in, in many ways, I have sympathy for both sides. I have concerns for the technocratic people who believe that actually if we put these drugs on the market and we make them available, and in five years' time we're able to establish, in fact, that they were of no benefit at all, then this could be a real problem. 
Um, I mean, we have the history uh, from product liability point of view, which have no doubt been reflected in one of the uh, questions that was in the causation study, which was a drug problem. And it's particularly interesting because it seemed to have been predicated on the grounds of the famous DES experience, which was a drug, diethylstilbestrol, which was given to um, pregnant women in order to prevent miscarriage. Now, the interesting thing about that from the point of view of the causation scholars was the idea of market share liability as a means of resolving the problem of not being able to establish causation. The case in question was such whereby the daughters of the women who were given the drug uh, developed vaginal cancer, sometimes 15 to 20 years after discovery, and they couldn't remember which drug was the one in question, because many of them had taken like 30 or 40 different uh, generic versions, 30 or 40 different versions of it from different manufacturers, because in fact the drug was not patented. But one of the interesting things about DES was in fact that it was actually designed to prevent miscarriage. It was completely non-efficacious. Not only did it cause the adverse effect, which was identified by Herbs uh, and Poskanzer and Ulfelder in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1971 of the vaginal cancer effect, but actually it was never of any benefit for anything. And I think this issue of non-efficacious nature is the thing that probably is concerning the technocrats and is something that I would be continued to be worried about. Um, in looking at this. It is a dilemma. How long do you wait and how long do you take to, to, to can you justify fast tracking drugs? In what circumstances can you do so? There has to be an element of scrutiny, I think, of these public, uh, these patient bodies who are activating just as much as there has to be a scrutiny of the regulators. Especially for the tremendous business that is done in selling useless vaccines, you know, when when the, 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 when, the, when the, the, the media industry comes up, uh, expanding tremendously the kind of scare and and alarm, and then governments kind of purchase it. Italy purchased billions of vaccines that then went thrown away because they were not really needed at all. So it's it's very the, the unholy alliance you're talking about is. It's there, you know. yeah, 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 exactly, on, on, on that flu stuff. Okay, more questions? Please. Yes. Um, thank you for each of your presentations. Uh, David Cabrelli, University of Edinburgh. One thing that struck me from your presentations um, was that quite a significant chunk of what you were discussing could be boiled down to the sort of debates between paternalistic type approaches to the regulation of law against more democratic participation uh, in the sense that there are certain spheres of human activity where uh, for one justification or another there is a um, a valid rationale for more paternalistic approaches where you have a technical small elite who has the expertise and you then, you know, you defer judgment to the, the small elite group. And because you've, you've recognized that it's a certain area of activity in which democratic participation uh, has no business to, to function, it, it sounds quite controversial what I'm saying, but um, you, perhaps drug regulation, environmental regulation, etc. Now that's not to say that democratic institutions and democratic, the majority, so to speak, uh, cannot lobby for change. But um, paternalistic, you know, this idea of the cost benefits um, that may justify certain um, approaches in that manner. It's just a thought. I'm here. Yeah, my name is Zishan Mansour. I'm from the University of Groningen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers for your really informative presentations. But I have a specific question for Professor Maria. 
Uh, in your divisions of the different uh, legal cultures, the, the three categories that you've uh, come up with, I was just wondering, I mean, to what extent do, the, to extent do the categories actually overlap? Because particularly regarding the first and the second category, because if I'm not mistaken, the first category refers to integration through finding a common thread of the law, and the second category refers to the constitu uh, constitutionalization of law. I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, there is considerable overlap as well. So, I mean, what would you say um, in this regard? Yes, I know uh, that there is this problem. I, myself, I said that uh, these are uh, more uh, some uh, analytical categories. Uh, I know that uh, they overlap, but uh, they overlap just sometimes. But in many cases, uh, in the most cases, we can see a clear differentiation. This is my idea, at least, because uh, when uh, uh, the Court uh, of Justice takes a decision on social rights, for example, in labor, right, uh, labor rights uh, and so on. It, um, it is uh, in front of uh, a contradiction between uh, the two dictates. And then uh, you can have a clear choice between the two. And in, in the most cases, uh, the Court uh, uh, in this field uh, decided uh, uh, following the third kind of culture than the second. My name is Alaji Jinka, the International University College Turin. It was an interesting, always an interesting session. At the end, I am happy to be general, and of course, my question itself will be general, but I am happy for the high table, this is it. The, the deepening of the cooperation between Europe and the United States on civil aviation issues is surprising at any time. Given the elementary, given the extremely complex legal, social, and economic issues involved, but, becoming at, but at any time when the EU and the US had experienced the several years of struggle of foreign policy disagreement, it raises a key question. Will the continuing deepening of economic ties keep the transatlantic relationship healthy regardless of the sovereignty of the immediate political conflicts? In this, it arises in me two general questions. What is the Euro technocratic approach to this atmosphere? Can economic interdependence provide the superglue that keeps a political relationship together? No, it's to the high table. I won't allow to go without uh, having the blessing of this table. I can answer, I can say, also, uh, maybe I can say, I'm not sure I got your entire question, but about the similarity between the US and the EU. Uh, uh, there are many similarities. Most of the procedural elements come from American administrative law even though we heard that the judicial review level in the EU and the delegation of powers to administrative agencies in the EU is very different from the United States. Nevertheless, the, EU, the US has pushed its administrative law standards through many international organizations. Uh, there's a competition in the world, as you, you know very well, between the main powers, EU, US, and now China, to make their standards, each one's standards, the world standards. So the EU, China, EU US investment list principles is something like that. Uh, I think, however, if one looks at the details, for example, what about the regulatory exception? You know, should people be compensated for what's called indirect expropriation if a government takes, you know, intervenes in a, in a business activity? for environmental reasons or labor reasons or something like that. I think there the EU and the US have different concerns. You know, at that, at that, that more detailed level. 
I'm, I'm sure there are many other, other differences. There is definitely, actually, in this competition within the, with, between the three superpowers, sure. something that resounds pretty well, the scramble for colonies. Right? Or? For the scrambling for colonies and other parts of the world. Oh, so it's, uh, well, it, standards, I think uh, that is what you're, you're pointing at. Basi uh, ba sure. Basically, there is this like uh, it's very pretty similar. clear sure. converging of interest of the big shots in sure. dividing up the rest of the areas of influence. Sure. And of course, if you are in the global south, you're screwed. Sure. Yeah, I did my yeah. PhD many yeah. years ago on Senegal. Yeah. I lived in a village in Senegal for three years. And I, one thing I came up, I was studying mainly land tenure, labor migration, production, organization, and, and dispute settlement, and so, and so on. Uh, I came across one example, I cannot remember now exactly what, of some standards, where some people in the village wanted certain standards for, I don't know what it was. And uh, thinking about that, it, it becomes clear that the standards may be good for the future or for everyone, but in, there's also a, the idea that the proposer has the most benefit. So it may well be that the Chinese or the EU or the US pr principles are better for everyone, but of course they're proposing it and they're there to benefit. That's partly why they propose it. And, 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 also, and also there is something, <laughs> it seems to me, that is uh, go, going, going on about uh, you know, how much the construction of this, uh, of this Europe that the Eurocrats share in their culture is a, very, is, is a construction of Europe uh, as a competitive block against the other two, against China and against the United States, so that the identity of Europe, rather than being an identity based on some sort of rich standards of inclusion or of social welfare or whatever was of, of rights even uh, ends up becoming within the competitive scenario of the international competition that is a very important point you added to the conversation sure. so that it unifies for the purpose of striking hard outside rather than sure. unifying for the purpose of the internal people That's in fact the, one yeah. can go further just yeah. add a footnote to this one can make a distinction between, on the Europe, from the European point of view, uh, on outward FDI, you know, sending money to China or investment, and inward FDI, getting money from China, for example. And the EU has agreed, and the member states agreed, that the rules that they're making now should be concerned with outward FDI. In other words, we want the Chinese to follow certain rules. But the member states do not agree that the EU should have the competence on making rules about inward FDI, money coming from, from outside. The member states want to control that because they have different priorities. You know, Germany, Italy, France, UK, they may have want to control inward FDI. I mean, that's part of the negotiations, but that's, from what I've read so far, that's one thing which political scientists consider to be unlikely, you know, that inward FDI rules will be Europeanized to protect the, yeah. you know, the sort of commons view in each different, different, different countries. Okay, now there is one more, two. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Professor Goldberg. Um, I really like the way you presented the EU pharmaceutical regulatory uh, system as a, as a technocratic one. I agree with that. I'm not sure I, I agree with the example you chose to give, one of them, which is the transparency of clinical trial data. And I'm referring in particular to the EMA policy on disclosure of clinical trial data that was adopted a little over a month ago on the 2nd of October. As I see that as a, as a success for democracy to the extent possible, uh, and what, what I mean is after the first time the EMA proposed adoption of the policy, adoption was postponed because of the massive amount of responses to the public consultation in the range of hundreds from, you know, pharma companies, but also uh, scientific community, even individuals. And the second time around, there was an another time it was postponed, the adoption was postponed because of the intervention of the EU ombudsman and other like political reactions to that. So I was wondering if you see the EMA policy as an example of democracy or technocracy or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Thanks. Um, I mean, 
and I totally agree with you. I mean, the, my the discussion and issues as to these the nature of these reforms. Sorry, the mic. I agree entirely with you on that. They weren't so much illustrations of actually technocracy, but the idea of the democrat of the process, albeit within the constraints of a, temp of a technocratic system. And I think that the, the, the EMA is showing some really important moves there. And I think, I think uh, one cannot criticize them for doing that. I think the problem then emerges when you have these developments is there are organizations um, and I think that International Federation of the Pharmaceutical Industry and, their, and these bodies need to take stock of this, is that when they do support restricting issues of disclosure, that's not necessarily going to be supporting the ultimate um, idea that openness and transparency is going to be encouraged by the pharmaceutical industry. So what you have is you have a slight double hand here. On the one hand, you are seeing these... Uh, this de democrat democratization, but you've also seen attempts at restricting the process. And I think I, I, I showed that through the, the, the American case, Abbey V. That's not to say, and I think this is also important, that there are issues surrounding trade secrets. I certainly don't subscribe to the view that everything should be disclosed by a pharmaceutical company. The problem, I think, that's going to emerge over the next two to three years is this issue as to what should constitute a trade secret, what should actually remain confidential, and what should not. And I think determining that delineation there of the line between what is acceptable in terms of non-disclosure and what is acceptable in terms of disclosure is, is, is really interesting, actually. Um, and if we can come to some form of consensus that can involve a, a democratic element to that and also take into account the views of the regulator and the safety of the public, then I think we'll be making advances. Thank you. We take, uh, if there is one last question, we take it. Uh, Chantal Mack, University of Amsterdam. Thank you very much for your presentations. I would like to briefly ask you about the role of the judiciary in shaping legal culture. And in particular, I would like to follow up on Professor Goldberg's thesis on the possibility to democratize the uh, regulatory process through litigation. So here I was wondering, do you perceive the courts as mostly technocratic institutions which apply the rules and then receive the trust of the public and in that way could contribute to, um, to the shaping of legal culture? Or do you actually think that there's a potential for democratic deliberation through the interaction between national and European courts? And if the latter is the case, then to what extent is that really a democratic process? Because litigation is not that easily accessible to all parties. Thank you. Well, that was basically pretty much what I remarked to your comments too. Yeah. I think your, your analysis is, 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 is quite accurate here. And much of this is going to depend on several issues. Much of this would depend on, I mean, first of all, let's deal with, part of my thesis was to suggest that the advocate general opinion of the decision in October was significant. It was significant because it was the first case that had been referred by the Bundesgerichtshof um, on the issue of defects ever to hit the European Court of Justice. And then when we see the question, it's incredibly narrow, very, very defined, and almost, you know, it begs the question as to how far it can go. Uh, the difficulty is, as you say, who is generating the questions? Are these people themselves essentially technocrats in terms of what they're trying to do? I agree that's part of the problem. How I see democratization coming into the process is partly through the process of clarity and uh, doctrinal uh, uh, cohesion, um, 
uh, in terms of the law, which I think can only occur through increased transparency of what the decisions are, and particularly at a high level, but also the process of litigation itself. I think we know this from America, that access to justice and litigation through these methods has enabled discovery and enabled disclosure of information which would probably not have come out actually to the regulators. But, of course, you hit the nail on the head by the real dilemma, which of course is the one of access to justice. The track record in relationship to access to justice um, in the United Kingdom in respect of medicinal products is utterly appalling. One of the reasons why it is the case has been the debacle surrounding the measles, rump, mumps, rubella vaccine litigation because so much money was spent on legal aid on a case where there was, there was no causal connection between the, the vaccine and the damage in question. And that was used, of course, by those zealots who want to come, cut back on funding as a reason for actually, um, you know, cutting back in this process. So the whole issue of access to justice, there's no doubt, is relevant, is relevant to this process. As to the actual judges themselves, um, and whether they can contribute, are they going to contribute a technocratic approach? I would hope, actually, interestingly enough, if we were able to fuse these methods, that we'd come up with something which was more acceptable to both parties. For instance, in the AN National Blood Authority case, Mr. Justice Burton had a decision which I didn't agree with in terms of an analysis of blood, and I've written such. Though, nonetheless, he does talk about the issue of social acceptability, which, of course, does sound quite democratic in principle. If one was to fuse that with risk utility analysis, you might get much more of a common balance between the commercial interests and the interests in relationship to individual in question. So you might have a technocratic, democratic balance in decision making, but that can only occur, I think, through greater access to justice, which is a huge problem in this field, especially on pharmaceuticals, because these cases are so expensive. There is also a big issue, it seems to me, of uh, uh, maintaining, you know, the, 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 some sort of political pressure going on. I don't think there is any possibility f for the law in any domain whatsoever. I, I, I'm ready to state it very bluntly to do anything good in terms of social emancipation unless it is accompanied by a strong and diffused political attention around it. Uh, the law by itself won't do it. I mean, especially, and, and, and there is a lot to say also how much American law in these last few years has been closing access to justice by a variety of technicalities that makes it impossible today. For example, class certification, there used to be something that was obtained as a matter of course in American law. There was never an issue to obtain a class certification. Now it's becoming a damn difficult thing and it was closed exactly in order to favor the interest of Walmart in a famous litigation of a class action against them. So there is a whole area to be studied and developed that is so, so far has not been approached by scholars, which is the level in which courts of law are actually not insulated anymore from organized economic strong pressure. You know, we've been assuming, especially in the common law tradition and especially in the United States, that, you know, tenure of office of judges uh, and uh, salary, you know, the Article 3 of the Constitution guarantees are kind of enough to insulate the judicial process from organized pressure of the strong corporations and is proving more and more and more coherently false is a huge ideology that only legislation is captured, whereas case law is not. Mm -hmm. And either we are ready to go and challenge that point of the fundamental relationship between sources of law, or we're going to blah blahing in a lot of rhetoric, I think, from, from this point of view of access to justice. This is, it seems to me that is a very important, it's a point to be taken into consideration, Absolutely. that it's taboo. Absolutely. It's taboo in American law schools. You know, you cannot do that. You start doing that, it's like you are, you know, swearing in a church. It's, 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 it's really kind of this very disturbing from, uh, from my, my point of view, this. Anyway, said that, I'm sorry that I, I, that I maintained the last word. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful afternoon, and let's enjoy some food and some drinks. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>